Thank you all for coming. Thank you in particular to our panelists for coming. I'm very excited about this event for a couple of reasons. First, we have a, a really a great group of speakers. These are people who have been involved in an exciting process that has never happened before. That is, we have laws passed all the time. We have rules passed all the time. But dealing with a technology that has such fundamental promise to change the way that transportation works, that people interact, that our, we leave our lives, they were the first. They did this. So I'm excited to document this process, to show how this law was actually made, how the statute was passed, how the regulations were developed, how individuals interacted and acted to make this possible. And that's both the substance of the law and the process. And the other reason why I'm really excited is because Nevada is not the only state to do this. They are and will always be the first. But since Nevada passed its law and developed its regulations, Florida has passed a statute. California has passed a statute and is currently developing its own set of regulations. Now, self-driving cars, autonomous vehicles, automated vehicles, driverless cars, use your term of choice. I've been asked before at conferences, so Nevada passed this law. So everyone's driving an autonomous vehicle, right? There's an assumption that, well, if you pass a law, it, it makes the world come true. It changes the world. It, it changes reality. As we'll talk about, self-driving vehicles are being tested in Nevada with human operators in the seat. They are being tested other places. They're being tested around the world. There are not yet commercially available production vehicles that drive themselves as, themselves as we understand that term. There is an increasing level of vehicle automation. And as we see in the next few years, technologies coming out that can do more and more of the driving task, we'll see how the rules in Nevada and the rules elsewhere actually adapt to that technology. In the meantime, let's figure out what actually happened in Nevada. So I'd like to introduce <coughs> our distinguished panel. Um, Marilyn Dundero loop is the newly reelected chair of Nevada Assembly's Transportation Committee. Uh, Bruce Breslow, at, to her right, is the current director of the Department of Motor Vehicles and, also excited to say, the new director of the Nevada Department of Business and Industry. So Bruce, this, this may be your last official act as Nevada DMV chair. This is it. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Bruce is also a, uh, an Olympic announcer, so I, uh, I'm expecting a real show. <laughs> and then I'm also <laughs> thrilled to have Troy Dillard, who is currently the deputy director of the Nevada Department of Motor Vehicles, but as of two days will be the director of the Department of Motor Vehicles. So really an all-star cast of the key players in this process. And for each of you, I'd like to ask first, what was the first time that you heard about these technologies? you got to introduce the lawyer. And the oh, lawyer. oh, excuse me. Excuse I thought you were saving all... the best for last. <laughs> <laughs> David, you're all the way down there. It's, I need those special glasses, which you're not wearing anymore. Oh, yeah. Here, I'll put them on for you. There you go. Anybody see... who wants to take a look later, feel free to come on. <laughs> I can see you much better now. Okay, there you go. Thank you. David Estrada, legal director. I'm recording this, by the way. <laughs> legal director for, for Google X. So starting with you, David, what was the first time that you heard about these technologies? And what was the first time you, you heard about your role? In them? Uh, so that's, that's, that's actually pretty fun. Um, I came to Google from the YouTube acquisition um, back in 2006. And I had worked at YouTube from 2006 until 2011. And at YouTube, gained exactly zero experience in robotics or self-driving cars. Um, but an opportunity came up, and it was just, it was discussed with me. Hey, we need a lawyer to go work with this group. Um, and I was absolutely blown away by the opportunity. 
because I had, I had seen the cars driving around a lot. And raise your hand if you've seen our self-driving cars driving around. Yeah, they're everywhere. Um, so I had seen them drive around a lot. I'd never been in them. I thought it was going to be amazing technology. And so when I got a chance to be the first lawyer for the group, I jumped at the chance. Um, when I joined, the law in Nevada had already passed. And the first task that I was asked to work on is, hey, we just got this law passed in Nevada. And it requires the DMV to pass some regulations. Um, there are a number of things that the regulation has to have in it. And we'd like you to go to Nevada and start working on this. Thank you. Well, um, as chair of transportation, when, and I, can I just go on the record with one thing? I just have to say this. You know, it's the legislature, everything's on the record. My brother went to Stanford, and it thrilled me to be able to tell him I was coming to Stanford to speak. Yeah. You know, there's nothing like being siblings, no matter how old you are. <laughs> and I was, he was number three, and I was number four of five, so it was really a big deal for the little sister to be able to say that. You stole my thunder, because I was going to say my grandmother's finally proud of me. I got in Stanford. <laughs> <laughs> I never could get in any other way. So as chair of transportation, um, the transportation committee is allotted so many bills, or bill draft requests. And um, so in this case, I had a lobbyist come to me and say, you know, this is, I would love to put in an autonomous um, vehicle bill for Google. And we need to find, you know, can we find a place for it? And so because we have a limited, finite amount of bills um, for the committee, we found a bill that it would go with. Um, and it actually was with the... Uh, um, Vehicle, yeah, yeah. It was with another vehicle bill. And so we put them together, and, um, and then we start to work on it. And originally, I was very skeptical. And I'm sure there are some of you in here that might have felt the same way. You're thinking, oh my gosh, we're going to put these cars on the road, and nobody's going to be behind them. Are we just going to say, see you later, and hope they get where they're going? So initially, there I was a little bit worried about it. And then I did some studying, and I was sharing with some students um, earlier that we have researchers in legal capacity there at the legislature, and um, so I asked for some information. Um, we heard the bill, which included a video, and after we heard the bill, I really saw not only a lot of um, important information that we should get ahead of this, because it's coming. Um, no matter what we're going to do, uh, our technology is, is way ahead of us, even for what we all know now. And so um, I thought that was important. And the other reason was that I shared with some people tonight, I actually saw a need and I thought about, I have a 92-year-old mother who is still driving and she's fabulous. She's going to live to be 110, I can promise you this. But the, the thought of her staying home to her is just absolutely um, disability. I, she just shuts down if she thinks she's going to have to stay home. So think about, as an older person, how great it would be to be able to have some kind of a vehicle that might be able to assist that person or a disabled person. So I had to think outside the box. And um, as a teacher by trade, um, I sort of take care of those who, who need help. So I guess that that was also one of my motivations is I realized that there was a lot more to this than just a, a fun car that would drive around and, and around the lake and uh, for you. So. Is there more than the fun car? Well, they're pretty fun. <laughs> um, my first experience learning about this was also a call, I believe, from the same lobbyist who said, we're going to introduce a bill in Nevada for cars that drive themselves. I'd like to know if you'd like to see the technology um, and let us know if the DMV would be opposed to something like that. Um, I immediately flashed back to the 1964 World's Fair, which was before a lot of you were born, where my grandfather took me and they had all these exhibits. And there's a whole building about the car of the future. And quite frankly, 
there's never been a car of the future in my lifetime. So that's the first thing I thought of. Wow, this could finally be the car of the future. And then I went to YouTube, <laughs> and thanks to uh, the company that you were working with, there were a lot of videos of Google's car, most of them by people that saw it and were tracking it and taking photos of it, and then some from Google. And I went to the Google campus um, and was given the privilege of riding in the car and then I won't say driving because a car does the driving, but sitting in the driver's seat while it went up on the freeway and back. And that sold me on the technology. Uh, but the real reason is the, the mobility and safety. Um, this system, when it's perfected, according to the National Highway Transportation Safety Director, will save approximately 95% of all people killed in fatalities on the road today. So. If we didn't screw it up with overregulation and this and that, and, and Nevada could be part of the development of the technology, there's a fine line between regulating and overregulating. Because if we overregulate, they'll go to some other state, they'll never come to Nevada, we'll never help the technology evolve and develop. And that was a measuring stick as we went along, is we need <clears throat> to get this right. And Thanks to our assembly chair, she only gave us seven months to develop the regulation, so it was a quick time frame for us. Mm -hmm. um, we didn't want to mess it up. So we'll get more into the details of what we, what went on during that, but that, that was my introduction to it. And how about for you, Trey? You know, I, I think it was it's all similar. Um, originally, this was just a, an article in a, in a newspaper with a car with a, a radar uh, spinning on the top of it that somebody made in their garage. Um, only later did we find out that was true. Somebody did make this in their garage, um, and, uh, and it's come a long way since then. But uh, I remember uh, Bruce coming forward and, and saying, hey, we got this bill. Um, it's, it sounds like a really interesting concept. And, uh, and I looked at it, and I'm like, you're crazy. Uh, you know, we're we're going to put these things on our roadways, and, and uh, you know, there's no way. And then I did the same thing. I started looking at, at uh, both the language of the bill itself, which was problematic in its original design and, and needed some tweaking to actually fit it into the, the system and how we would be able to regulate it properly. Um, but more importantly, uh, I was convinced after looking at the safety aspects. And, and what was really behind this technology was the advancement of, of society um, and safety. Uh, moving forward, the uh, the amount of, of potential lives that could be saved because of the software functioning to the rules of the road and not being distracted. Um, it, it's pretty commonplace that the vast majority of accidents are because of distracted driving. The human element is wonderful, but it's also a cause of a lot of tragedy as well. So looking at this um, in, in its infancy, you know, you just jump to the driverless cars, and, and you don't have to do anything. You just jump in these cars, and they take you where they want to go, and they go park themselves and all those things. And, and someday we may be there. Um, we're not there yet. But the, there, there, was nobody, there was nobody pursuing this at the time. And just thinking back on, on how much technology has really changed just in the past decade alone, let alone the last, you know, two decades, um, cell phones have not been around that long, and now everybody's got one or two. Um, this was inevitable. So we saw uh, an opportunity for the state of Nevada from an economic perspective. We saw an opportunity for the state of Nevada from a historical perspective. And we saw an opportunity for the entire country and the world, frankly, from a safety perspective. So from that moment, we really started getting into this. So as we talk about law, as many of you in the room know, there are different elements. There is the statute that a legislature passes. And then there are the rules that an administrative agency, like the Department of Motor Vehicles, makes to implement that statute. And then finally, there's agency practice that the agency also follows in, in further implementing the directives of the legislature. All of that is law, and all of that is what we're going to talk about. I want to start with a very brief overview of that process and of the content 
of each of those laws. Um, so as a general question, what is the statute that Nevada passed? And Marilyn, maybe you can start with that. Well, let me get out my cheat sheet because <laughs> I need that there. And how many just how many bills are passed in a legislature in a year or are considered? Well, uh, truthfully, it is a um, it, there is no limit really on the amount. The limit comes within the fact that we in Nevada have a 120-day legislature. Uh, Time period. You should clap for that. And <laughs> so, and we only meet every other year. So, very unlike California. So, we have a finite time to get things done. So, um, that uh, stops many bills. <laughs> and then, uh, but there, you know, I don't know, I actually don't know the amount of bills. I want to say probably over a thousand, I, wow. would, I would venture to say. Um, and each one is given a number, this being Assembly Bill uh, 511. So we know we have that many. <laughs> and uh, so, um, and some bills are dead before they even are really developed. But the way that um, usually a bill comes about, and this one was an alternative uh, fuel for uh, vehicles bill, and so, you know, we go to the Legal Counsel Bureau and within our legislature and we say there's going to be this autonomous vehicle bill. Um, the lobbyist has talked to Mr. Breslow. He's talked to myself. Uh, Google has talked. Uh, you know, everybody's kind of come together. They start writing the bill. And then it starts getting tweaked. And, you know, my description, and in this case, um, we tweaked it quite a bit um, to make sure it was right. Um, once again, I, I apologize for the analogy, but as a school teacher, I, I use the cookie method. You know, if you want chocolate chip cookies and somebody says, I don't like chocolate chips, and you take that out. And then somebody else says, I'm allergic to flour, and you take that out. Somebody else says, but I want nuts, and you put those in. By the time you're done, you know, you may really have just chocolate mousse. You don't even have chocolate chip cookies. So, I mean, that's kind of what happens with a bill. Um, you start tweaking, and somebody says, but I won't vote for it if it's not, you know, blah, blah, blah. And you take that out, and then somebody else, uh, Mr. Breslow may say, but in DMV law, we have to have this in here, and so we need to put that piece in there. We don't want to overregulate, so Mr. Dillard suggests that we do something else. Uh, maybe, maybe Google's competitor comes in and says, or GM comes in, or somebody comes in and says, wait a minute, you know, I want this. So we try to strike um, a happy medium. And then it goes to the committee. And then the committee asks questions. And um, sometimes amendments are brought forward by committee members. And then we finally get the finished bill. And then that is voted on by the committee. And if it passes, then it goes to the other house, whether it's assembly to Senate or Senate to the assembly. After it goes to each house, it goes to the floor for the legislature at large. We vote on it, and then it would go to the other house, of course. And then when it's all said and done, it goes to the governor's office, and the governor can veto it or, you know, so it's simple civics at that point. But um, the development of the bill is, is actually can be quite a few people, and so even sometimes, um, in some cases, it can actually be different agencies. And I want to talk about that development. Before we even get to development of the bill, though, David. <clears throat> Why did Google decide that a bill was necessary? Um, I think this is one of the most interesting questions, and it, it goes beyond um, what we've done so far to what's going to happen. We looked at the state of the law, and we thought, we as a big company, we are probably going to invest a lot of money in this. And first, we want to make sure that we have a predictable legal groundwork to make sure that we don't invest potentially hundreds of millions of dollars in something that is not legal. Like, let's say you go ahead and you develop um, all of these thousands of cars and you get ready to go put them out on the road. And as soon as you do, some regulator comes by and says, you know, you can't have self-driving cars in the state um, or nationally. So 
we looked at what was the state of, what was the, what, what existing regulations were there, and did we feel comfortable that state regulations or federal regulations would permit or prohibit. Um, here's what it came down to. We saw the car as taking over some of the functions that the driver is otherwise in control of. So you as a driver, when you drive in a state, you have to comply with what are called the rules of the road. Ne Nevada has its own rules of the road. California has its own rules of the road. The rules of the road say when you come to a red light, you must stop. Things like that. When you go through a school district, you must travel at 25 miles per hour. These are all state laws, and the federal government has nothing to do with it. Um, states also issue driver's licenses. The federal government doesn't control or issue driver's licenses. States require you to pass the driver's test, and they require you to be in control of a vehicle. Well, if you have a self-driving car, are you in control of the vehicle when you're not in it? Does your license allow you to, let's say remotely, let's take a case of a car that can operate remotely. You're not sitting in the driver's seat. You tell the car, I want you to go, for, here's point A, I want you to go to point B, which is 50 miles away. Nobody's in the car. Does my driver's license allow me to do that? Um, we don't think the CHP officer driving next to the car on Highway 280, who looks in and sees no driver, is going to think, oh, sure, that's just David's car. It's totally fine. Um, so we have a real practical problem. We may interpret the law, and in some ways you could interpret the law to say, it's vague, go forward. But in a practical, in a practical society, the CHP is not going to view it that way. You have to change things. So we, we thought it was necessary to go get a legal framework established that would say, these self-driving cars are explicitly legal. They're explicitly legal with and without the presence of a driver. But we're not going to be so greedy that we want, we want the great state of Nevada to just say, go ahead and start selling them. We're willing to say, but the cars need to have some safety mechanisms. Um, and so that was the idea we came up with, which was, let's see if we can get some states interested in expressly permitting self-driving cars and at the same time regulating their safety. Why Nevada? Um, we thought that Nevada was a wonderfully friendly state for us. It's a state next door to us. It's one that has lots of open space. Um, we thought that they might be interested in allowing us to go test there because there's a lot of open space. And we thought that the regulatory process there might be a lot faster than it would be in a state like California. <laughs> Bruce, how many days was it? <laughs> Basically, we had seven months to draft the regulations after the law passed. Pretty and fast. So, and, and I want to hear all about that. Um, but even before we get to that, we have quite a few steps first. Um, when you were considering moving forward in Nevada, did you consider what would happen if you failed? If, say, the bill did not pass? If it turned into a highly restrictive measure? If the regulations that happened were or particularly hostile state of technology. Yeah, so we, we definitely considered what's going to happen if this essentially boomerangs on us. And we go in and we say, hey, regulate us, and we get regulated, and it's terrible, right? It, it kills our business. That's definitely something we considered. Um, there's something that I, we thought we had going for us. Like, let me ask you guys, who here, if you had the opportunity to go get in one of these self-driving cars, and push the button and let it drive you and take your hands off the wheel, who here would do that? There you go. Um, and you've never been in it, and you have no idea how safe it is. Um, what we realized is um, Google has a lot of goodwill. Um, people really trust Google, and they've seen the cars around a lot. <laughs> oh, they trust the Google car. All right, I'm sponsoring a bill next time. <laughs> so we thought that it was worth the risk uh, because we thought we'd have friendly people to work with. Did you consider what happened if it succeeded? Uh, yes, we did. Um, we thought it would be great for us to be able to go in, and now that we have a clear legal path, 
um, we could go into a state like Nevada and start testing a lot, get people used to seeing the car around, start expanding our footprint, learn the roads more, and get closer to commercialization. Copycat legislation? Absolutely. And we've had lots and lots of copycat legislation that we've either um, gotten involved with and tried to work to our favor or, or opposed. Yeah. So start with the actual mechanics. What practical steps did you take to start this process? Of, of the bill? Mm -hmm. So um, a process like this almost always begins with a lobbyist. And um, we, we have a lobbyist in Nevada who we worked with, and he um, went ahead and worked with some folks, our good friends here, to help get the bill, help get the bill introduced. And Miran, where did the actual original language come from? Um, well, I think you know all bills start with our legal uh, counsel bureau, and one of the things that we had to do was we actually had to define what what was an autonomous vehicle. I mean, so you had to put that in the bill. The other thing that we had to do is we had to um, require, because you can do different things in bills. You can say they shall, they may. You can require, and in this case, we required the Department of Motor Vehicles to have some regulations authorizing um, the operation of these vehicles. So then we had to, um, you know, so then by requiring them to do it, that, that meant they had to do it. It wasn't just something that they could do if they wanted to or not. We also, um, when we asked for them to define the autonomous vehicle, we, um, we put some language in there to mean a motor vehicle that uses artificial intelligence, sensors, and global positioning systems coordinating to drive itself without the active intervention of human operators. So there was some actual language within the bill that started to define where we were going with it. So it was very broad. Yes. Bruce, did you want to do it? Oh, absolutely. This is the coolest thing I've ever seen in my life. But I looked at the legislation as, as not broad. Um, when, when we looked at regulations, and looked at the law, we quickly went, well, that's fully autonomous without the active intervention of a human being. But that's going to be a long time from now when that car is ready to be sold to somebody, 10 years maybe, maybe longer. We wanted some semi-autonomous language where it's a partnership between the driver and the car, but we kept going back to the law saying it says without the active intervention. Um, since Nevada did this. I firmly believe that by adding a layer of acceptance, a government says yes, and, and the massive amount of pressure got all over the, the globe, and Nevada got all over the globe, that opened the door to the, the magic kingdom of California as well, which for Google, since you're based in California, um, added a, a sense of legitimacy that would move this forward, and I thought that was very important. But as we are looking at the law, and since then, the National Highway Transportation and Safety folks, they have a draft of that's quite frankly better than ours, better than the state of Nevada's definition for autonomous because it has five layers of autonomous. But their committee and us, we had nothing to copy. There is no such thing as a self-driving car when this came out. There's no such thing as language. There's nothing to base regulations or law on. We were creating it to start with. So for us, we needed to get all the stakeholders together. And we worked with um, just about every auto manufacturer except for Chrysler. They ran a commercial opposing self-driving cars two years ago at the NBA All-Star Game. We had the insurance industry come in. They had other issues. They looked at it, which really was good for us. They looked at it as a safety issue. They thought this would make it much safer on the road one day. That helped. We brought in public safety, very skeptical. In California, I believe, that initially the law was going to have um, public safety do the regulations, and they refused to even get in the car so far, which tells you how far out of the box they think. Um, but we needed public safety. We wanted the judicial system involved. We didn't want the trial lawyers, because that would have stopped it in its track. So somehow, we did it so fast, and she did it so fast, that. 
they never caught on, and we got the Nobel Prize. <laughs> <laughs> well, when second, you only have 120 <laughs> days, what do you know I mean? If you don't, if you don't get moving, and with 120 days, you're done. And, and I want to ask you about that, that, that they didn't catch on. Were there people whose mm -hmm. involvement surprised you, or people whose absence surprised you in, in both of your processes? Marilyn. Um, well, we didn't. Uh, Bruce's seven months actually was all of all of that seven months was not all of the hundred and twenty part of the hundred and twenty days. So the bill actually came later in the session. It wasn't like it was introduced the first day of session. Um, I think that with all bills. Um, Unless it's something that you're really paying attention to, and I'll use, since we're transportation, a, a drunk driving bill, for example. You've got a lot of uh, outside groups that are really watching uh, DUI bills, you know, dr MAD or things, you know, outside groups like that. So they're watching for bills to come up, but nobody was watching for this bill. And, and that actually helped a little bit. Because you know, um, the, you know, the more cooks in the kitchen, so um, that helped. But by you have to, you really have to think through when you do a fit bill, though, of all the unintended consequences. And you may still sponsor a bill and end up with unintended consequences. I mean, uh, one of the things that I, what, I don't remember if it was Mr. Dillard or Mr. Breslow, but you know, all of a sudden it was, well, you have to have a driver's license. Or you have to have an endorsement. You have to have something that says you can drive this. Just like if you go drive a big rig down the highway, you've got to have some kind of, some kind of a different license. So there's all those little things. And there still may be, when this finally comes um, full circle, there still may be something that someone out there, whether it's the DMV, whether it's the legal group, whether it's Google, that there may be an unintended consequence is what I think will happen. But then the bill gets tweaked. The law gets tweaked from there. You know, something happens to make it right. Because sometimes when something is so new like this, you don't know what's going to happen until it, it happens. And I think it's actually going to happen sooner than we think. And in this process, David, was, was publicity advantageous? Is it a disadvantage? Um, hmm. We didn't seek a lot of publicity in the, during the process. What we, what we did through, throughout was we wanted to introduce the idea to key legislators, to the governor, um, to Mr. Breslow. We wanted to make sure that people who were going to be responsible for making the decisions on the law and the regulations um, were comfortable. And, as Mr. Breslow said, as soon as he got in the car, he really enjoyed it. And so rather than trying to do lots of public relations and getting you know, all of the citizens of any state or location involved and excited about it, we thought it was more important to work with the public policy makers directly, make sure they would get behind it. Um, there is a practical reason for that as well. If, in fact, you're delivering something new to a society, people, people could get scared, right? And if you make too much hay about it, you might scare some people. And we didn't want to, we didn't want to be too over the top and create any opposition that, that wasn't there to begin with. A very similar bill actually failed in Arizona sometime after yours. Mm -hmm. Anything strike you that was different about that process? Yes, it was introduced by a legislator or legislator who had no friends, no <laughs> clout, no credibility, and was using it to try to make his name as opposed to somebody who could deliver a bill like this lady right here. Yeah, that's exactly right. Well, and I will tell you, uh, thank you for the compliment, but that it is really important that when you do any bill, it doesn't matter what the bill is, it really is important that um, not only that you can garner the support from your colleagues, but you also um, can make sure that when you set your mind to, to push it forward, that you do it in a very succinct um, way with some, with some background so that you don't get your, yourself caught. Um, because if you get yourself caught, it's the, it's, it goes down south real fast. 
So this bill passes. In fact, it's two bills, one an assembly bill, one a Senate bill. And it lands on your desks. What do you do? Well, for us, it, I gathered uh, a group. I call them research and development because their name is way too long to call anything else. Um, and said, we have a group of probably four plus Troy, a deputy director. And we got together, and I told them what this was about. Showed them a video, and everybody around the room thought it was really interesting. They were panicked that they only had seven months from that point forward to do regs. And there, again, there was nothing to copy anywhere in the world. They had to basically draft them out of thin air and take them off all the other projects which they were working on because of the time frame involved in this, right, Troy, to, to do this. So in that time frame, we needed to gather the people from the National Highway Transportation. We needed the auto manufacturer's participation. We needed Google's participation to de demonstrate the various technology. Um, we needed the judges. We needed law enforcement because there's so many components and everybody had an interest. Um, the ones that opposed this, who tried to add either very, very strong language that would have kept this from ever happening in Nevada, or eliminate it completely, was the Alliance of Auto Manufacturers, which is the lobbyist group for all the car manufacturers. They had a couple car companies, specifically Chrysler, that was trying to stop this bill and inhibit our process. The individual car manufacturers contacted us directly, and they took part in this. Because as we come to, came to learn, all of them have a project now on self-driving vehicles except for Chrysler. Um, <laughs> one of the things that we thought was critical, and I, I want to jump right into this if you don't mind, Brian, Please. is imagine, as you, you said, a police car following a car. There's nobody in it. You can't pull it over. There's nobody to pull over. What if, that, what if you come across a car that's been T-boned and there's nobody in it? Is there a dead body somewhere? Is there somebody staggering out in the field, a half unconscious? Is, there a, is it a self-driving car? How do you determine whether it was in self-driving mode or not? For law enforcement, for insurance, for the court system, and for the person who has the responsibility over the vehicle? Well, I thought of something relatively simple. I wanted a light bulb. It was on, means you're an autonomous. It's off, you're not an autonomous. That got beat up every which way from every car company, <laughs> NHTSA, everyone else. Instead, <laughs> instead, we have introduced in our regulation something very unique, and I don't believe any other state has copied this part, but it requires a separate mechanism, a recording mechanism, that will deliver through the court system, like you would subpoena something from the black box that's separate from the black box, 30 seconds of information prior to an impact. Since these systems are so smart, and Google's in particular is so smart, they could probably show you a 360 video of what occurred if that's how they set it up. Um, so you had privacy issues. You had all sorts of things. But that was a defining piece of our regulation that would let law enforcement know, let the insurance company know, let the court systems know. For God's sakes, if you can cut through the red tape of five years of litigation, because you can show what occurred, everybody wins except for the trial attorneys <laughs> in, in, in that case. So that is something that we introduced and, and that made it in our regulation that had some opposition, because nobody had a device like that except for Google. Um, but the capability exists to, to have some kind of monitor that lets you know, was it an autonomous mode or not? So we didn't define what it had to say or what it had to record, just that there had to be something that monitored it. And that was a keystone part of our. Now, when other states started looking at it, they just started cutting and pasting our law. And then Google luckily got involved in some other uh, car manufacturers and added their touch to some of these things. Florida's law basically says, come on over to Florida with a sunshine state. You're all legal. Come drive. <laughs> <laughs> California's law that they just passed says you have until 2015 to develop regulations. And oh, by the way, 
you have to regulate the safety of these vehicles. Well, when we looked at it, we didn't want any part of regulating safety. Liability does not belong with the state. It belongs with the manufacturer of the car or the equipment that goes on it. So these are critical discussions that all these stakeholders were involved in. Should it be in there? Should it not be in there? Should it be part of it? How would it enforce it? Would it kill the progress of a technology that's going to change all of our futures? So we had a lot of things that, that we were looking at, and we were getting advice from all over the board. I will tell you that our regs would have been this big had it not for, been for David Estrada. Um, he has a very practical way of giving us and, and our attorney generals who were working with us great feedback on reality as opposed to what a state might do. And then we had a gut check every time saying, if we put this in, are they just going to go to the state next door or this state or this state or this state because this is too big of a hurdle? Is it really that critical because we think it's a good idea um, that it would kill the opportunity to develop the technology? So there were a lot of checks and balances, a lot of stakeholders we talked to. And in the end, I think it took us five months to draft the regulations and two months of review with the Legislative Council Bureau looking at the legalities. And one of the things that we did not determine when we did the regulations was that the owner of the vehicle is still responsible as, a, as the owner. The Legislative Council Bureau made that determination that somebody has to be responsible for that car, and they assigned it to the person who has the owner, owner, the owner of that car. So we did not set up liability law, but they at least put some parameters around it because how do you put your arms around something if there doesn't have to be an active human being in it? So there was a lot of so, discussion. So Brian, if I, if I might, um, I think that we, we started jumping into the program development, but I think there's one other element that I, I'm not sure that we really touched on, and, and that is back before the before the law actually lands on our desk and then we become responsible for development of the program and, and the regulations and putting it into place, is that we also had to be involved with the construction of the law. So what, what comes out of uh, the Legislative Council Bureau, uh, typically what happens uh, is that one of the legislators tells the, the, the Bureau what it is that they want. And then those attorneys go and they craft up a bill draft request. Rarely ever, and I think Marilyn probably will support me in this, does that bill actually read exactly with what they want. It's the cookie method. So, exactly. <laughs> so from there, it requires a lot of uh, change, um, correction, direction to accomplish what it is that the bill sponsor really intended for it to accomplish. And then you get into all of the changes related to the parties that, that want other things added, removed, etc. as Marilyn was speaking about earlier. But in this case, um, the DMV was involved in making some of those uh, changes, or at least offering suggestions for some of those changes. And, and Marilyn had mentioned one with the driver's license. Originally, the bill said that it created a new driver's license for uh, an autonomous vehicle. So coming at this program that, that doesn't exist anywhere in the world, you have to start asking questions that you don't necessarily know. You certainly don't know the answers to, but you don't even know if the question is, is on point. And one of them about the driver's licenses was, was very much in that scenario. How do you issue a driver's license for a vehicle that doesn't exist? Who's the driver? What do you test? How, how does that fit into any structure that exists out there today? And, and, and we believe the answer is it, did, it didn't. So we looked at that, and we had to modify that. And what we wound up deciding to do uh, and I still don't know if this is, this is the long-term solution, but it's the solution that we wound up with for, for the very initial version of this wheel that we had to develop, was we changed and went with a restriction on an existing driver's license. Um, and in looking at this, we didn't see the truly driverless car being on the roadways anytime in the very near future. What we did see is what is out there and available today in, in many different uh, cars is that there are pieces of autonomous technology in those vehicles. So they may operate in certain environments in an autonomous mode. They may operate at certain speeds. They may operate um, in straight lines, or they may operate in urban only, only urban environments. So we had to look at that. Well, how do you develop an endorsement for autonomous vehicles? What do you test? What do you train? 
because they're all different. You don't know. So our philosophy was, let's make it more of a liability issue that, that, what, that what that particular endorsement does is it says you are required and that you're <clears throat> attesting that you know the restrictions of the vehicle in which you're going to be operating. So no matter what the technology is, no matter who the manufacturer is, no matter what version it's in, you're the one responsible for knowing that. So the liability, once again, as LCB determined, it has to be with the owner of the car. So that's how we want to in that particular one. And we, and we provide other input first. And talking about, about that one, because I think it's very interesting, mm -hmm. an early draft of the regulation actually said that the vehicle shall have all the rights and responsibilities of a driver. And then that was changed. How? What input did you receive? Who, who led to that change? I do not recall. <laughs> Actually, I don't. Um, <laughs> we were all involved in, in, the whole industry was involved in commenting on various drafts. To be honest, I don't recall a situation when, I don't recall a draft that tried to put the responsibility on the vehicle, but I think what it would have meant is if you do put the respons responsibility on the vehicle, um, you would have to be looking at the manufacturer of the vehicle. Um, if something goes wrong when the vehicle is operating and the vehicle fails to comply with the local law, or the vehicle itself gets into an accident, um, but I don't know. I don't know if you recall changes to that. You know, I'd like to add one thing to what um, he was saying about the um, driver's license. Also, the other piece to us adding the driver's license endorsement was if we made a new classification of a driver's license, it would have, driver's license, it would have had a fiscal note. And as you can imagine in California and in Nevada, a fiscal note is certain death to anything. So um, it's... Uh, and, it, and explain what a fiscal note is. Well, if we would have required a new driver's license, it would have required the DMV to develop, not only take time and manpower to develop those regulations. But you also have to print those. I mean, they have to be developed, they have to be designed, they have to, there's all kinds of information that has to be done, and then that costs money. So money is a fiscal note. So any bill that you do in the legislature, unless it is something that is, um, well, I don't know, let's say education, if something had a fiscal note, but certainly with this, because it's not something that we need today, it had a fiscal note of, I don't know, even, even I don't know, $500,000. That's $500,000 that the state could be using anywhere. So if something has a fiscal note, it can be not only voted down by your members, but if it is, even if it went all the way through, the governor may say, I'm not going to vote on this because it has, I'm, I'm going to veto this. So that's a very important distinction, and so we came to the agreement that it would be an endorsement on the driver's license as opposed to a new um, classification. For fiscal reasons. Mm -hmm. So that, that's, that's fascinating. Um, and in, in terms of the fiscal impact, um, one version of the bill had been estimated to um, have $205,421 in, in costs, all in 2011 and 12. Um, 150,000 in programming, 4,000 in regulation. Are these, were these numbers close? Probably, but when, and programming for us is writing computer code into the brain of the DMV so that every office and every technician and every computer can see it, read it, touch it. A change here goes into the master file, which goes, um, and, you know, where all the data is stored, it can be retrieved, et cetera. That's where most of the cost comes from. In this case, we ate the cost. This was so important for society. It was such an important thing for us to do that we did not really put a fiscal note on this one because we wanted to see it happen. And internally, we pushed some other projects back so that we could work on this. So we supported this from the get-go as, you know, this comes along once in a lifetime if you're lucky. Something that changes the face of how people will ever be in a vehicle in the future, a different kind of mode of transportation. 
letting a blind person drive, keeping people. Um, there's a whole generation of people that live a lot longer now. They lose the ability to drive somewhere between the age of 80 and, and 100. Well, they're going to live to 110, 115. But the ability to stay mobile is so critical for the future of society. All of these things, we swallowed the cost on this. And in terms of the relationship between legislature, between the agencies, were there any particular tensions or any particular sensitivities? So for example, in DC, often there's partisan gridlock. And in Nevada, you had a Democratic chamber and a Republican governor. I think in this case, um, there wasn't necessarily. There is in many bills. But that goes back to the relationship piece that we were talking about earlier. Um, my personal philosophy is we're, we're there to do what's good for the state. And um, it's very important that we create jobs. <laughs> we create safety. We, we have education. I mean, I can go down that list. And this, this pulled in jobs, this pulled in safety. So um, I think that um, you have relationships with people. Certainly if you have contentious relationships with people, it's harder to get things done, whether it would be Mr. Breslow, Mr. Dillard, myself. I mean, if, if I don't want to see them and I don't like them and we don't get along, I'm not going to call them. Or they're not going to call me. And then I could still maybe pass the bill at some point, somehow, in some form. But then when it gets ready to go to them, they're not on board. So it really serves no purpose. Um, you know, it kind of goes back to the old piece of because nice matters. So, you know, if you kind of play nice and, and you get along together, um, your parties can go away, which is what happened with this bill. Um, we worked together. Um, we brought it forward. Mr. Breslow and Mr. Dillard were kind enough to help me along. I needed their expertise. And when the governor saw it, he's hired these gentlemen. So he wants it to be successful also. And um, if he had any questions, he probably would have called them <laughs> before he called me. So um, it's, it's very important. And to add on to that, politics plays a role mm -hmm. in everything. Mm -hmm. So. In order to get the contracts approved, we have something called the Board of Examiners, which is the governor, the lieutenant governor, the um, attorney general, and the secretary of state. I put three of them in this car, including the governor, arranged for them to go 20 miles, turn around, and come back. Halfway through, they got out. The car then drove with them sitting in it. Google cooperated with that. Once you experience that, the world changes for you. Your perspective changes. And politically, it was important for us to have their buy-in. You have a Democratic attorney general. You have a Republican governor. You have, you have the various components. So you want to make sure that the key players not only see it and understand it, but they get the wow factor of it. And once they did, then they started thinking of safety, economic development, being the first. Trust me, when I sent the press release out after we licensed Google with this testing thing. Along with it was the picture of our governor getting out of the car with the spinning thing on top. Um, politics plays a role in all of this. And she did a masterful job getting this passed. And they did it so quickly that really the opposition didn't have a chance to even think about it. They did all gather in California. Um, you had a much more difficult road pass this bill in California, but it, it still passed. You bring up something that, that's it's very interesting, which is in when, when we talk about interpreting law, we talk about a legislative intent and say, well, what was the, what did the legislature intend? And, you know, as, as you were talking about it, Bruce, you said, well, on, on one hand, we had to develop regulations, and on the other hand, those regulations couldn't stifle the technology. And how did you decide that that was the appropriate role for the DMV? Every time we thought of a brainstorm, we had to ask our question, 
would Nebraska work? Would they go to Nebraska to do this if we added this, if we added that? This seemed like a good idea. Give us some feedback. David gave us some great feedback. That's already in the law. The law is the overriding factor. The law has the definition. You can't come up with three versions of it, which we thought we could. So taught working with our attorney generals who work in a much slower, I mean, this would have taken <laughs> 15 thousand years to develop if we gave them the assignment, or working with outside counsel and working with NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety folks. This is way out there, right, folks? They are so on board with this. You wouldn't believe it, how fast they're moving on this. Now, they're not going to set the bar and set the requirements and the standards right away. They're going to wait and see if they have to um, before they do rulemaking. But they came to Nevada, the administrator, the deputy administrator, their other people. They've been monitoring this all along. And Google has, has done some work in Washington. And they are very much focused on this technology succeeding. And that was the measuring stick we used. With what we do, we can't keep this from succeeding, this technology. I think to, to add to that, though, is um, we certainly did not know it all. Uh, we were not going to consolidate a team of people from the Department of Motor Vehicles and just start, start setting regulation and pretend that we knew what we were doing, because we didn't. And it was a conglomeration of, of a, a great many people, uh, a lot of different backgrounds, uh, a lot of different mindsets, a lot of different interests. Uh, business interests, political interests, science interests, um, and seeing this technology move forward. I, I really don't remember anybody who really was just a complete barrier to this going forward. Everybody had interests, but everybody saw the good uh, for society as a whole of this moving forward. So keeping that in mind, we always had the focus on safety. So every time it came to one of those those decision points where we had to, to say, do we go this direction, do we go this direction, or do we go this direction, which is the right way to go, safety was always playing a factor in that and ensuring that we were protecting the interest of, of these ideas and the benefit that it was going to cause with the regulatory structure that we were creating. So that took a, a, a stakeholders from all walks of life to come together, and it was amazing the amount of things that we learned things that we went in when we were helping construct the law itself that we had no idea that during the regulatory process when we had that seven months, I mean, that's fast, but at least we had input coming from so many different areas out there that we didn't have during the construction of the law itself that really led us in directions that we wouldn't have thought we would have been going in when we started that process. Um, there's some people from Bosch that are this year. I thought Bosch was a speaker company. Um, they are a major, major <laughs> electronics firm. <laughs> they had comments that ended up being part of our regulations because they came to every meeting and they participated. And there were things that they, perspectives that they brought. Um, Mercedes flew somebody out. Volkswagen, Audi, BMW, Nissan, Nissan General Motors. Some came from Japan, some came from California, same came, some came from Detroit. They came together because they wanted to make sure that we didn't mess up this technology and the future. One false move that's wrong, not only when you're driving a car, if it has an accident, does it set back the technology and the liability and everything, but one bad move by a state could have destroyed this program too. So the stakeholders and getting them all together in that short a time frame um, was pretty remarkable when you look back on how it was done. So yes, safety. I want to ask more about, about the safety piece. And then I want to move to some audience questions. So um, if you have questions, would you please line up at the microphones? And then we'll get your voice on recording. Um, on the safety piece, you know, how do you know? you know that what you've done in, ensures safety? How do you even know what safety is? Well, yes. I, I can tell you for me, one of the aha moments was actually, and I think it was a, I feel, I feel like it was a YouTube video, 
um, I saw in one of the videos a car come around the corner and somebody was crossing in the crosswalk and the car stopped. So for, for me, when you say, do you, how do you know what safety is? When I saw that video, at that moment, it was like, oh my God, we could save thousands of people that are getting hit because a person cannot go from seeing somebody to putting their foot on, you know, to thinking, to putting their foot on the pedal, even though it seems like seconds, it's long enough to hit a person, a dog, a cat, a, whatever it is. And so when I saw that video, that for me was a very important piece in safety. So when you say, how do you know what safety is? I guess it might be something different for every single person, but that's an inherent problem in Las Vegas and Reno when you have thousands and or millions of tourists every year that come to our cities that unfortunately may or may not drink, cross streets, <laughs> and get hit. Because when they've had drinks, they think they can cross the strip <laughs> and they get hit. <laughs> and I'm thinking to myself, we are burying people every week who now somebody, I mean, and, and think outside of the box now because it's a PR problem. When you go home and say, uh, my friend that I went with didn't come back with me to their parent. So, I mean, then people say, oh my God, everybody in Las Vegas, all they do is drink. So it's, it's, I mean, it's really a bigger, it's a bit, you know, you, you have to really start thinking outside the box. It's not only just a normal everyday, a child crossing a crosswalk at a school might get hit. I mean, truthfully, it's, we've had a real horrible rash of pedestrian deaths because of that exact thing. And so that was a real aha moment for me and then how to put safety in the regulations. Mm -hmm. First of all, one day when the green license plate's available, this is the car that a manufacturer would sell you. A Toyota, a Lexus, uh, General Motors, Ford. Once a manufacturer puts a car on the road, they have tested it, tested it, tested it, tested it, tested it in every condition. The, li the liability is behind them. We weren't so much worried about this side. We are worried about the testing of these vehicles until the technology was there for people to be able to stand behind the product. So most of our regs have to do with the testing phase. Two drivers must be in the car, two operators at all times. One behind the wheel that can assume control if necessary, one monitoring. That is very, very important in, in what we did with the regulations. There are so many other things. The application, you must have 10,000 miles driven in autonomous mode. You must be able to prove that. You must have a training system for your operators. These cars are so smart that if a, in our, in Google, yes, thank you for wanting to come to Nevada because we have a lot of empty roads. Mm -hmm. You wanted a test on mm -hmm. the Las Vegas Strip, okay? <laughs> so we're on the Las Vegas uh -huh. Strip doing the drive test, which was the final step, and we're right there, and bicyclist swerves right out, right in front of the car. Car stops, right in the middle of the intersection. The car, is better than the human at avoiding an accident. But in doing so, you have to understand that the other humans behind it aren't so good at it. So their testing protocols, getting from the operator on this seat to be the operator behind the wheel, is very strict. <coughs> they have to scan the rearview mirror at all times. They know when their car is going to stop. And they have to be able to override that system if the car behind them is too close if they get cut off. There's so much that goes into the safety that the testing and the requirements of the safety plan is something that's part of our requirement, that we have to review it. We have to see the technology. We have to do a demonstration of the technology. You have to apply for geographic areas. Do you want to be on a road that's a federal highway? Not many things on the road there. What about a state highway? You might have cows on that road. Rural roads, they have school zones, they have roundabouts. You may program a car perfectly to drive a roundabout. Humans have never figured it out. So now you have to program a car to do what you think the human might do in a 
You know, there's so much to it. We have 15 kinds of school zones in Nevada. Google's really smart, and they can say this is a 15-mile-an-hour street, but it may not be a 15-mile-an-hour street if the sign says when children are present, or from 7 to 8 p.m., or this, or that, or different speed limits. So the car has to be able to be able to, be able to adjust for that. There are so many um, fog, ice, snow, nighttime driving. So in our application, not only do you have to indicate what roads you want to be on, what environment you want to be in, what weather or nighttime or things like that, you have to be able to educate us to the point where we trust you enough to be able to allow you to test in that environment with two people in the car at all times. So on the safety side, we have this layer of precautions during the testing. Now the manufacturer is liable. They have, they have to make sure it works. In the testing, we have a surety bond. Besides normal insurance requirement, requirements, if you want one to five cars in Nevada, you have to put up a $1 million bond. That keeps Billy Bob's garage from putting a car on the road and setting this program back for generations and generations. That has kept some pretty strong companies from moving forward in Nevada. But the, the bar has to be set, and that was a, even though it's an insurance level, it's a safety feature that went into our development. And also, uh, you know, why, why test in the, in the real world? You know, um, the, the cars have to be programmed to follow the rules of the road. But do you all follow the rules of the road? Right? We all break the rules of the road, right? But the cars are programmed to follow the rules of the road. Yeah. I don't. Yeah, Marilyn. <laughs> Jay, do you do you follow the rules of the road? Jay, I'm a three L. I'm actually at the law school. I'm in Brian's class. I want to say thank you very much all for making the trip and coming out and and speaking with us today. Uh, and I did have a question, and it does actually relate to the rules of the road question. And in particular, uh, we mentioned trying not to overregulate and the danger of creating a potential political backlash against the, the law and, and the subsequent regulations, and to borrow from the recent discourse, uh, potential red lines. And so I was wondering uh, if you could give us an example of such a red line, as well as if you foresaw any potential political backlash. Uh, of course, this is going to potentially cost jobs for some people, uh, whether they're carrying CDLs or taxi medallions or something like this, and so potential opposition there, or as Troy has indicated, potentially from those who get a little upset at just how overly compliant autonomous vehicles might be. Thanks. We didn't get any backlash um, at the Department of Motor Vehicles. Um, if you were to replace all the cab drivers of Las Vegas, um, the owners of the cab companies might like it, but you'll have cab taxi driver wars like in the 1970s with cars being burned and people found in the desert. Just that's the way it is. You got to be really careful what segment you want to in introduce this technology to. I mean, so how this evolves and the good uses for it and everything, it's never going to really replace the human being. It may be fun to have some cars that don't have a driver in them just for the thrill of showing it and exposing it to the whole world, the technology. But it's a partnership. And I think that NHTSA, National Highway Transportation Safety folks, they understand that there's a partnership to the point where there's some car companies, Mercedes is one that has a camera on your eye in case you nod off because the car is doing so well. It jerks your seatbelt and gets you back again. So we did not have the, that red line. You did mention uh, commercial drivers, though. And uh, that was a discussion topic as well, because most of the large uh, trucks that move around are actually manual transmissions. And as of yet, we have not seen the technology uh, with the ability to run a manual transmission-driven <laughs> automobile. It's purely uh, electronic transmissions that it's running it. So that, in the future, you know, when that becomes feasible, uh, the CDL really does become an issue. It's a red line issue. It's a hotbed issue. Um, one example uh, on the rules of the road, though, and going back to testing it in, in, the, in the real world is, uh, when I was in the car, we came up to a vehicle that had been broken down in the number two lane, and there was a tow truck there to tow it. So the vehicle stopped with appropriate distance before that vehicle um, in the travel lane, but we could 
it would never move over into the number one lane and continue on because all of us humans would accelerate to get around or squeeze in between the next car. But the car said it wasn't safe to do that, so it would never move. So those are the kind of things that they discover and, and during this testing process that exists in the real world that maybe doesn't exist on test tracks and those types of things. So R Rules of the road said if you get in an accident, you have to get out of your car and sweep up the glass. How does a self-driving car do that? So there's two words that were added in the regulations. We're applicable. <laughs> <laughs> kind of covered a lot of stuff. <laughs> Someone's got to figure out where it is applicable. Um, other questions? And please line up at the mics if you have questions. Um, I see a problem with rules of the road. I recall when the 55 mile an hour speed limit came in, uh, teenagers would get on the road from Los Angeles to Las Vegas, drive parallel at 55 miles an hour. <laughs> I see a problem with the autonomous vehicles being on a roadway with a 65 mile an hour speed limit causing a real problem for those human beings who are in a hurry. <laughs> That's what the passing lane's for. <laughs> um, you can, it's a partnership. This doesn't mean, and, and none of the car manufacturers are proposing that this will take the car out of your hands. If you want to drive your car, you can always drive your car. But how many of you want to be in bumper-to-bumper -bumper traffic for 45 minutes every day Stop and go, stop and go, stop and go. If you can let go, let the car safely do it, and you can do other things. If you have an hour commute to work and an hour commute home, that's two hours of lost productivity. It's for situations like that where you feel comfortable that you don't want to drive anymore that you would put in an autonomous mode. And yes, if there is somebody driving that 65 Mustang or the 69 Camaro that wants to get around you, you still have that trouble. They'll get around you. you. You can always shift off. But if everybody and if every car, let's say, went the speed limit, one, you'd have people angry that want to drive faster, but you would save so much money on gas. You would have cars much closer together because the technology allows that. It would let a lot more room on the road. There's so many safety features that kick in when cars can communicate vehicle to vehicle, that, that really outweighs that. But you'll, you're, they're never going to take the wheel out of your hand. Yeah. I actually have two questions, if that's OK. Uh, my first one is, uh, you mentioned about uh, there being a, 30, a rule for there being some sort of recording for 30 seconds before an accident. Um, how much of that legislature do you um, actually transfer to non-autonomous vehicles? And then my second question is, um, I'm a software engineer, so like I ship bugs all the time. Everybody does, and anyone who says they don't is lying. Um, so we how don't. <laughs> <laughs> well, you know, Google, Facebook. Um, <laughs> um, uh, so how how what what sort of le legisl le legislature um, exists to actually protect the software engineers behind this? That you know, because at some point something's going to slip through a net, and it could be some sort of bug. Like there was. I think Priuses a, long t uh, a while ago were not breaking for some reason. Um, if that sort of thing happens again, like how do you make sure that the software engineers are, are actually protected? Mm -hmm. Thank you. Hmm. Um, so I think this is a good question for all of us who took torts in our first year. Um, and also, what protections you have as an employee of a company when you're working on a product. Um, I think this is a good point for discussion. My own take on it is that Generally, if you're um, working for a company and you're performing your obligations and you're not performing in a grossly negligent manner or an intentionally, willfully um, uh, manner that would violate the law, that you are going to be protected from liability. It would be really interesting to hear if anybody has a different viewpoint on that. So the company is certainly going to face questions of liability if the company ships a product that has bugs in it and, let's say, the vehicle fails to do what it's supposed to do and the vehicle gets in an accident, there's going to be a big question of liability. And this is, this is one of the things we've all talked about most. Let's say that a person is in the vehicle, person has the vehicle in automatic driving mode, vehicle gets in an accident. Who's responsible if, in fact, the accident was caused by the vehicle failing to stop when it should have stopped? 
The driver is also there, and the driver could have hit the brakes and potentially stopped. But the vehicle was in driving mode. Who do, who do you hold responsible? I think it's a very interesting question where the trial lawyers will make a lot of money on this one. Um, and it will be worked out. And I do think our tort law system adequately, adequately takes care of it. I don't think we need to come up with very specific ways of breaking down this liability in our, in our legislation. I think that would be a big mistake and it would be overly restrictive. He and I told think, us that yes. during the process. <laughs> And, and I think it was a good decision not to try to parse liability in these bills because the tort law system can handle it. And, and in response to your first question, uh, it's only, it's the 30 seconds is only applicable to vehicles um, that are approved for the autonomous and are actually operating in the autonomous mode. It doesn't apply to any of the other vehicles on the roadway. Is it easily feasible for people to give up ownership of cars and have equivalent like a flex car or a zip car? They can just pull a car in the van and say, you know, Google, I need to go to Stanford Law School. The car zips up, picks you up, drops you off. And I've seen some cool test videos to show how it might actually work to uh, eliminate the need for private ownership of vehicles. Do you think that's feasible in the not too distant future? Can I just get rid of my car and you know, just call it up when I need it? Well, um, Sergey Brin stood up on our campus not too long ago with the governor of California when he came by to sign the the new legislation in California, and he specifically talked about something like that. And he would love to have a service that is essentially Zipcar, Uber, where you have an app and you order the car to come pick you up. It picks you up at your doorstep. It takes you to work. You get out and the car goes to the next place. And the potential for saving us all from having to own cars, have the car parked on the lot, I, I don't know how many hours he, he, he quoted, but for the vast majority of its time, a car does not get utilized. It sits there in a parking lot. And um, Sergey's a big thinker, and he thinks about how if you look out, if you walk outside any of the buildings on, on Stanford campus, look at how much space is taken up by parking lots. Or go to Google and look how much space is taken up by parking lots and the ability to get rid of that if, in fact, we're car sharing is also a nice thing. And it's generational. Um, younger people are more likely to use zip cars and zip bikes and things. Dr. Chris Ermsen, who works um, in one of the um, heads of the Google program, recently was at an event in Washington, D.C. at the Swedish embassy sponsored by Volvo, and the world press was there. And one, somebody asked him what car he drove, and he was responsible for this program. And he said sheepishly, I, I don't own a car. <laughs> so it's a generational thing where... People like us, you know, we got to have a car, right? but maybe not. And that's a great, you know, use for this. And Bruce, in, in Chris's defense, that was me. <laughs> oh, that was you who <laughs> said he had a car. <laughs> Bryant doesn't have the car. Sorry, yeah. Dr. Ermson, if you're recording this. <laughs> <on the class. laughs> so, so right now, um, on a, yeah. So right now, cars or these driverless cars are being legalized. Um, but at what point do you see? And I don't know at what point you're going to start pushing on this, where they're not only legal, but they have sort of like extra legal um, rights, right? So, I, for example, I'm thinking like speed limits. It could be 60 human, 95 robot, or something along those lines, where they're being treated differently by the law than what. Mm -hmm. I think it's going to take a long time, and I think that another big question we have to face is how can we push this out and how can we scale what we're doing already in the states? We have three laws in the states, and I think in the world, I don't think anybody else in the world has come up with a law. I'm, I may be missing it. but um, So we have a law in Nevada and in California and in Florida. And we at Google, we're going to just focus on working with California as much as we can as they develop their regulation over the next two years. So there's 47 states left. How much time would it take to push just this basic regulation out to 47 states? Is it feasible? Is that the way we're going to do it? Um, or can it happen in a way that's a lot faster? Before we even get to very advanced things, such as, for example, once it's legal for you to have this self-driving vehicle, Shouldn't you be able to have your laptop in your lap and be working for the two hours that you're stuck in traffic in LA? I mean, wouldn't it be wonderful if, if you have a two-hour commute and you're stuck in ridiculous stop-and-go traffic to actually get two hours of work done? Um, so those are the particular kinds of things that we would love to see happen. Oh, and I, I'd just like to add to what you're saying. More importantly, wouldn't it be great 
if somebody had been drinking and driving, to be able to get somebody to pick them up, not just get two work, hours worth of work done, which I would love, but I would love to know if my kids went out and drank, like a lot of kids might do, they're past that age, thank you. But, you know, I would, somebody could get them home safe and, and get them all home safe. So I think, you know, it's, it's an A to Z thing. It's not just work, it's also safety. Yes? So I'm just wondering, in the whole process, how much of a technical background did you have to get on how the car actually drives so that it can pass all the laws, all the regulations, to have a safe car and not to let anything out? Great question. Well, what, what we, um, we involved ourselves, and I think a lot of industry involved themselves. What we found was as soon as the DMV got involved in drafting the regulation, they, um, first of all, they handled it extremely competently. And, and like Troy was saying, they didn't have all the answers, and so they reached out to industry, and all of us who, from industry who were interested um, came and met with, with these folks, including our engineers who were working on the self-driving car project. Folks here from Bosch who, who were working on their technology um, came and openly discussed it in some forums that we had. And these folks asked all of the important questions. It was getting in the car. I made everyone in our committee that worked on this go for a ride in the car. And that establishes the comfort level enough that you can get your mind around it that you want it to succeed, therefore you'll work extra hard and trying to find what's the best regulation. But for us, it was getting everybody to be in the car. Now this is, it's very limited. Google advanced just in the seven months we were working on it. And they used to, it was so, they had to be perfectly in the middle of the road. It kept adjusting itself like, like this, like when you first start driving. That was completely smoothed out by the end because they're constantly working on things. Getting everybody in the car was critical for us to make that determination that we can move forward with this. That was our measuring stick. But first, let me push back on that because you know the question is what kind of technical background did you need? And you, I know, made a point of reaching out to technical experts from a variety of. We did. Um, there's a there's a lot of secret stuff in Nevada, as you may have heard. Um, one of the things that's, that's not military, but they do a lot of military testing, is, is this test group um, in the desert about an hour west of where we are, east of where we are, on Nevada Automotive Testing Center. And they test for the military, and they test for car companies, and, and they do it where nobody's looking, and they put it through every possible critical test. But we invited them just because it was logical to invite them to get their feedback. They wanted us to require, you know, 10,000 metrics worth of testing before any of these cars could ever be on the roads in Nevada to do anything. And we needed a much higher view of 30,000 foot on this. We did not need the micro view. The manufacturers and, and the people that are producing the systems, yes, they will use facilities like that if they don't have their own. But for us, we needed to look at more of a big picture. So we invited the big brains. Um, and it was just kind of a mishmash of everybody's great ideas with safety and common sense finally guiding us to regulations that were uh, reasonable. Thank you. Yeah, sure. So an unpleasant industry to think about at the, in this conversation is the nuclear industry, where like, if you go back to the 60s or something, I mean, it's just full bore floor. And their death ratio has been staggeringly low, and their productivity has been fantastic. And they've gotten totally wrapped up in psychological factors by the society that have held them back since then. And so just wondering if you all, in, in, as pioneers in this thing, if you have that concern that you know, once, like, like in a presidential election, once somebody shows a little weakness, once one bad thing happens, the feeding frenzy of the media comes. And they're going to come load per bear, and you had an accident here, and one person died. One person, forget liability; it doesn't matter who the liability is. Mm -hmm. It's it's you, and they're and they're after it. And there's one story after another, and it's bad, and it's bad, and it's bad. Everything that was positive today suddenly goes into that into that negative spin. 
Is that something that you all think about in some systemic, strategic way, statistically, how you defend against that, and how you plan for that, yeah. et cetera? I think, yeah, so our team thinks about exactly that problem where even though statistically our vehicles are going to be far, far safer than an individual driving a car, as soon as one crashes, a stigma may occur and people may not want to get in one. Just like when the reports happened of the Prius that had the, the sticky accelerator, which may have been false, um, as soon as that happened, nobody wanted to buy a Prius, which was a great time to go buy a Prius. Um, they, were, they couldn't get rid of them. Um, but it's a huge, huge problem that psychologically we will all re we will all dramatically overreact when one accident occurs, and an accident will occur. So our our team understands that, and they are incredibly focused on safety. And I and I just say that w what I think is the key piece of all of the legislation is the simplest, which is build a fail safe when the vehicle detects a problem. Now, it has to detect a problem, but build it very robustly so that it will detect a problem. When the vehicle detects a problem and it no longer trusts its ability to drive safely on the road, the vehicle has to come safely to a stop. So that, that's in the Nevada regulation. It's in, it's in others as well. So barring everything else, like put aside all of the other pieces of the regulation, that's the one that really matters to, to our team. And that's our, so our team is building to that. Um, we hope that the vehicle never reaches that point. But if there is a fail, a failure, we just want to make sure it pulls over and doesn't cause an accident. So I'd like to hear from Evan and then Alicia. And then I'll close this by asking all of you, what would you have done differently? And what advice would you have for others who are following in your footsteps? Um, Evan, uh, Alicia, come back here. Oh. I'm also uh, one of Brian's students in his class, so I want to thank you all for being here. Um, my question is sort of for David. Um, one, I want to hear a little bit more about the decision to pursue the legislative strategy. You know, it strikes me that a lot of breakout technologies don't wait for the law, don't ask the law for permission. Sort of what's different about autonomous cars? You know, it's a heavily regulated area, but a lot of areas are heavily regulated. Um, so what's different, you know, what's yeah. the position? Okay, so the reason was simply that um, driving a vehicle is regulated. So most, in most industries, you can sell a product, and selling the product is not a regulated activity. Using the product is not a, a regulated activity. So when we, when we sell this, um, it's, it's not going into a regulated market, other than there are, there are certain things you got to make sure that you're not going to have caused damage to people. Um, but that's mostly liability as opposed to a regulation. So people have to get licenses to drive cars. And we didn't want to put cars out in an uncertain environment where, um, like I said earlier, if, you, if we invested heavily into this technology and got to the point where we were ready to market vehicles and just go ahead and take the ask for forgiveness, not permission approach, um, it may go very badly for us. And that's the kind of thing that people at companies get fired over, is um, going ahead and bringing a product ready to go to market <coughs> without doing in this case, due diligence to, to make sure that you have a path forward to actually sell the product. Um, we also really, really did realize we care about safety and we want to make sure that the public is on board. So we want we want to have we wanted to have laws, and so it is a risky position to take to actively get regulated. But we wanted the public to feel that the that. The legislatures had looked at this. Safety experts had looked at this. The right rules were put in place. So it's OK if I buy one of these cars. Um, I have two questions. The first one is brief. Um, among those uh, car makers like Mercedes, uh, Bosch, whatever, they came to, to show up at um, the place uh, discussing or observing the situation. What are the or what were the um, major or primary uh, react or comments they have in terms of seeing the prospect of this type of um, uh, development? That's the first question. The second question, I'm going to jump a little bit forward. Um, 
because whatever I'm hearing today about this kind of car reminds me of those uh, airplanes being uh, operated by computer. Reminds me of uh, those uh, like uh, trains or like uh, um, uh, subway train, and they, just no one is like operating, right? So they're the same thing. So they became a norm now. So what I'm, I'm thinking is that I can foresee this to be a norm eventually. But then I'm, my question for you is uh, two things on this uh, question. One is that even though there are a lot of potential obstacles and we were di discussing today, but can you foresee when the critical mass might, achieve, might be achieved and this can become some kind of norm, that's one thing. The other thing is, if this become a norm, will you, will you uh, foresee some kind of changes of the road, road construction, such as like uh, built in some certain ways which can kind of work with this kind of uh, 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 cars very effectively and then save a lot of um, yeah. uh, costs and so on? Um, I'll speak briefly too the final point, which is, so we, we think that it's going to happen incrementally, and you will not notice a huge leap from one form of driving technology to the car actually driving itself. And it's already happening, because you can go buy a car, let's take a Volvo um, or a Mercedes that has what's called um, ACC, Adaptive Cruise Control, which will keep you in a certain position relative to the car in front of you. It has lane keeping. It will vibrate the wheel and cause you to bump back into the lane. Um, it has what's called traffic jam assist. Some have self-parking. Um, there's all of this technology that is getting very close to self-driving already. And ours is going to get closer. But these are coming out every single year, more and more advanced every single year. Um, and when, when our vehicles, if our vehicles come out, they probably will also come out in a, in a limited fashion where perhaps you may be able to drive a self-driving vehicle in certain places and not others. Um, people will get used to seeing them on, a ro on the road. Perhaps in a fully driverless scenario, maybe that will start out, let's say, in a retirement community. And it'll be in potentially purely private roads. And, and maybe um, I will be able to call the service and have it come pick me up and drop me off, but fully in a private scenario. And then it will grow out from there. Again, in such a way that you won't notice a huge transition. Most of them don't want to talk publicly. It's very proprietary information. Um, Troy and I have had the opportunity to work with a lot of car companies. You can buy a Mercedes now that has you know lane keep or lane assist. It'll stop. Cadillac General Motors this year sells one that does the same thing. Volvo has City Safe where they'll set up a demonstration and you can put it in cruise control and go right at a brick wall. They set up cones instead of a wall. It'll stop rather than, than impact. So all of the manufacturers are working on new technology. There's also different type of technology being used in Europe. Very small individual mobile units that can use um, in urban environments, low speeds that will take you from point A to point B by telling it where to go. It's an area that's already been mapped and programmed. Um, you'll see pockets of different types of technology with different companies. You'll see it in motor, uh, motor sports. You'll see it in, in racing. You'll see it in every type of environment, bicycles, the whole thing. But like David said, it's going to creep up on you, but it's going to be very fast. Our technology is changing. These 22-year-old robotic engineers are so good. And I mean, I had a cell phone that weighed seven pounds and was this tall about 10 years ago. We're all carrying a little, you know, computers everywhere. You've got the Google Glass product that's going to come out hopefully soon. That's um, people my age will never get used to having it tell us what to do and where to go and mapping and this and that, but. My son, that's a must-have. He has to have one of them. <laughs> and so it's, it's generational, and it's going to happen. We just need to make sure that there's a framework for it to happen as reasonably safe as possible. And most of the, the comments that they did share were protective of the development of those technologies in their cars, as they've been working on these for years and years. So uh, they wanted to, in, to really 
dive into the definition parts of, about what is and what isn't considered autonomous. And we focused a great deal on that in the regulatory process because we, we were bound by the definition that was in the law on what it was. So what we focused on in the regulation is what it wasn't. So we went in and defined many, many scenarios and I think that made many of them comfortable with some of these technologies. They were coming out, lane centering and things like that, that really weren't fully autonomous based type technologies, that they would not be included under the requirements in Nevada for autonomous testing. So as you look back on that process, for each of you, I'd like to ask, would you have done anything differently? And what advice would you have for other states, other companies, the federal government? other countries, and that could be with respect to the process that you followed, with respect to the substance, the actual result of your process, or the roles played by individuals, um, by legislature, agencies, um, courts, private actors. Um, Why don't we start there, since I got to start at the beginning. <laughs> seems fair. From, uh, from my perspective, um, I certainly would have liked to have more time. I would have liked to have been able to dive in a little bit deeper. Based upon the circumstances and scenarios that we had, uh, the teams that we were able to put together, the uh, interest groups that we were able to bring together, um, I, I don't know under those circumstances that I would have done much differently. I, I think for this being the pioneering step in this particular thing, we really have autonomous vehicles 1.0 here. This is not the way it's always going to be. This is just a starting point. This is the wooden wheel, right? We have to keep moving forward and, and developing it just like the technology does. So in the development of this, I think even today that we, we have a good framework. Um, it certainly is going to evolve and it will certainly need to be adapted to changing technology and changing times as we go along. But for, uh, for a, a first try, I think, I think it was very successful. I agree with Troy. That's the beauty of doing things with regulations. You can always change them. It's not as hard as changing law. It's not as hard as drafting a law. Um, and they should evolve. And if another, we tell every state, do it better. Do it better. Um, I don't think we got the 30-second prior to impact thing right, but I don't know anything better yet. Um, law enforcement loves it. The courts love it. The insurance companies love it. Car manufacturers don't know what the heck we did or how they're going to do it or what we really mean by it. So I think that part may need to be revisited once there's a commonality in the auto industry of how to produce that. Um, I don't think it's something the DMV in Nevada lives or dies with, but it's the best we could come up with in that short of time since they shot down the light bulb. <laughs> which, which, by the way, we all we all nicknamed the Bulb. <laughs> that's what it got replaced with. So, I guess I, I kind of live by, and I would say this to other states. I kind of live by, you know, nothing ventured, nothing gained. So, um, you know, I started out the process a little skeptical, but nothing ventured, nothing gained. And then as I got into it, I realized sort of the magnitude of it. And, and I was sharing with some students earlier tonight, you know, if I don't care who you are. If you can't get excited about technology, you've got to be living under a rock. And, and I agree with Mr. Breslow about the brick phones, but I was even looking at when you were standing, I think it was Jay was standing there looking at his phone, you know, with his question. And I was thinking, we used to write on our hands. You know, I mean, so, I mean, the changes that have happened, no I mean, so truthfully, I mean, we have, we have all got to embrace what is going on here, and other states should do the same, um, because if you have an autonomous vehicle, you're not going to go from California to Nevada and then stop. You now, granted, you might be able to get behind the wheel and keep on going, but wouldn't it be great if you could drive across country? So we want the, the laws to be consistent, and uh, I, I just think it's, it's a really exciting time, and, and uh, 
the younger generations are really lucky. What, what an exciting time to, to be alive and see what's going on. Um, I'll be real quick. I was really happy to see how competent everybody was in the process. It was, it was remarkable because this is really complicated technology. What was really, um, really cool to see was how quickly people got up to speed, how open everybody was to learning what they needed to do to get this right, how earnestly everybody uh, wanted to get this right, including the staff that re reports into the DMV. They worked really, really hard on this, and they took their jobs really seriously, and that was just fantastic. And I've seen that um, in each of the states we worked in. And so to the extent that a lot of us are skeptical about politics, it was really cool to see how good at this some people are. Um, the only thing I, I, that comes to mind initially about you know what to do differently is to make sure that you talk to others in the industry um, and hear what their perspectives are before you rush headlong into going and trying to change things because you could upset people and they might get on board with you if you just talk with them um, and you might upset them by not talking to them and you might get somebody who's opposing your legislation simply because you didn't bring them into the process um, and talking with people really really matters and making sure everybody feels heard really matters so we'll leave you to ponder how many nevadans it takes to change a brez bulb <laughs> 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 wow good turn good, 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 good.